Hey, what is up, mortals? It is Shara Zorel here with a new video for you. Welcome to part 18 of What If Izuku Was a Stand User. I just wanted to greet you guys by saying hi. I am still crazy excited to continue this series. And also, this episode is a bit more special to me because over the weekend, I got to interview Richard Epcar at KatsuCon. Richard Epcar is, for those of you who don't know, the voice of old Joseph Joe Star. He's also the voice of Joker in the Injustice games. He was in bo 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 He was in so much stuff. Just, I think he has over 600 credits to his name. Look him up when you have a chance. Such a nice guy, but this episode hits a bit harder for me after I met him at KatsuCon. Anyway, sit back and relax. You guys are really in for a treat this episode. So, we begin. When we last left off, Izuku had finally crossed paths with the unbreakable diamond himself, Josuke Higashikata. In the process, he told the boy the truth about his personal Jesus and became the first person to see and make out his stand's ability. This epiphany startled Izuku and left him with many questions on who this Josuke character was and what else he knew about this power he keeps calling a stand. The man invited Midoriya to sit with his group and go over what they wanted with him to which the Greena took a few steps forward. However, Midoriya, wait! Jiro grabbed the back of Izuku's t-shirt, stopping him from walking any further. Midoriya, can I have a chat with you in private for a sec? Before the boy could respond, Jiro yanked the boy back to the sidewalk so she could tell him what was on her mind. Jiro, wh what's going on? Midoriya asked with concern. Kyoka crossed her arms and took a narrow-eyed glance at Josuke and his friends, who were staring at her in confusion and quietly muttering something to each other. What's going on? Dude, do you have any situational common sense? That guy is acting sketchy as frick! Did you hear him a moment ago? He said he'd been looking for you for the last few days like some pop-step stalker or something. You don't just walk up to someone and say, Hey kid, we saw you on TV. How would you like to come and sit with me and my friends? We've been looking for you for the past few days. That's just... You don't just talk to people that greet you like that. I got a bad feeling about those guys, Midoriya. I say we ditch him. The green-eyed teen could tell Jiro was uncomfortable with Josuke and the others, especially with how he seemed to catch the two by surprise and the mildly aggressive way the man introduced himself. But he remembered something Higashikata said to him that made Midoriya see this in a different light. Wait, you think those people are trying to swindle me? Izuku asked. Possibly, Jiro answered. Either way, that guy was acting too weird, dude. Jiro, I, I don't think that guy's a threat to us. Oh, and how do you know that? He said he's with the Speedwagon Foundation. Jiro raised an eyebrow at that response. A couple of days ago, Aizawa told me a group from the Speedwagon Foundation came to UA for a meeting with Principal Nezu. They said someone in their company wanted to meet me and said it had something to do with my power. That Josuke guy is probably the one they were talking about. I mean, yeah, I'll admit it's pretty strange that these guys found me out of the blue like this. That's putting him mildly. Yeah, but Jiro, I I know you won't fully understand this from my perspective, but I actually want to see what this guy wants. Midoriya, I really don't think Jiro, this guy can somehow see my personal Jesus. Izuku interrupted, stopping Jiro's response. He reacted to it when I summoned it and even described what it looked like. This is the first person I've ever met that's done this. He even keeps calling it a stand for some reason. I, I understand why you'd be against me doing this. Really, I do. But I'm going to be honest, Jiro. I I've had this power for about a year now, and there are so many questions about my quirk that I still haven't found the answers to. Questions that keep me up at night just thinking about them. Like how I'm completely immune to Mr. Aizawa's quirk, or how absolutely no one can see my power. But that one guy over there somehow can. I mean, I think that guy has the same type of quirk that I do. Look, I know on the surface this doesn't seem like a good idea, but I think this guy could give me the answers to my power that I haven't been able to discover for the past year. Don't worry, if these people are bad news, we'll just get up and leave, okay? Jiro's arms remained crossed as she took another narrowed glance at the group, eyeballing her from their table as she thought to herself for eight seconds about what Midoriya had said, before sighing in a disagreeing defeat. <sighs> Fine, Jiro sighed. This is really weird, Midoriya, and 
I don't like this, but... Okay, I'll play nice. But if these guys mug us and steal my hero costume, I'm going to kill you, man. Midoriya chuckled anxiously at Jiro's words, unable to tell if she was serious or not. All right, come on, let's see what these guys want. The duo walked to Josuke's table as the two pulled up chairs to sit with the group. Jiro and Midoriya obviously sat next to each other as Kyoka sat beside Yukiko, who smiled and greeted the earphone girl, even complimenting her hair, while Midoriya sat beside Josuke. Uh, alrighty then. So I understand you have a few questions like, why are we here, what do we want, and all that jazz. Well, let's start this off by talking about this quirk thing you got going on. Josuke took a sip of his cappuccino before he continued. I had a feeling you treated your personal Jesus as a quirk, which I can completely understand since you're from a place with quirks and a dozen superheroes on every block, but I'm going to give you a reality check, kid. Your personal Jesus power is not a quirk. It's called a stand. Yeah, I remember you calling it that, but what's a stand? Midoriya asked. Is it like a slang word for a type of quirk or something? No, it's a... <sighs> okay. Stands and quirks are two completely different powers. A quirk is just a superhuman ability a person can develop. A stand is a physical manifestation of a person's soul that acts like an extension of yourself. Midoriya was silent for a few seconds, processing what the man had told him, while Jiro glared at the man, wondering if he was serious. So, wait, what? Are you saying that this thing is... is my soul? Midoriya asked, pointing his thumb at personal Jesus, which spawned from his body and stared at Josuke's crazy diamond. In a way, yes. Quirks are biological powers, while the stands are more... supernatural. It's also an ability that can only be seen by other stand users. So if someone doesn't have a stand, your power will be completely invisible and intangible to that person. Which is why your friend here likely can't see my crazy diamond. But you can. Both Bidoria and Jiro looked at each other as they silently thought about what the man had said. So only someone with a stand can see my personal Jesus? Josuke nodded to the boy's question. I... Uh, okay, I... I'm sorry, this is just a lot to take in, but if what you're saying is right, with stands be this new type of power that's different from quirks and can only be seen by others with that same power, then I guess that explains why you and everyone else can't see my quirk, Jiro. Stand, Midoriya. Your power is a stand, not a quirk. Josuke corrected. Oh, right, sorry, my, my stand. Yes, it's a stand, got it. Uh, y yeah... Anyway, as you know, I possess a stand myself, but we're not the only ones. These are my friends, Okuyasu, Koichi, and Koichi's girlfriend, Yukiko. They're stand users like we are. The trio Josuke introduced along with himself revealed their stands to the Greenette to confirm his words. Midoriya reacted in awe at the stands that appeared before the boy, even showing a special interest in Yukiko's power more than the others. All while Jiro was looking around confused as to what the heck was happening. So all of you have the same power I have? No fooling? And wait, do you have a stand and a quirk as well? Midoriya asked Yukiko. The black-haired girl was confused at the question, but Izuku clarified that he could see her moving her hair, giving the boy the assumption that Yukiko had a hair manipulation quirk. Oh no, I'm quirkless. We're all quirkless. I just have a different type of stand from the others here, where my stand is embedded into my hair. Its name is Love Deluxe. Jiro looked away and rolled her eyes in disbelief at that. All the while, Midoriya whipped out his hero journal and began making notebook entries on the stand abilities of everyone at the table, even muttering to himself about the possibilities of everyone's powers. That was until Jiro stopped him from further creeping out the others. After that, Josuke's look turned serious as he shifted the conversation topic. All right, Midoriya, now that we've got the quirk thing out of the way, it's time we talked about why we're here. Firstly, I need to know. How long have you had your stand for? Uh, wait, what? Izuku stuttered. Your personal Jesus. How long have you had it? Uh, about a year now. Why? Izuku asked. Josuke and his friends looked at each other in slight worry as Higashikata pulled out a Polaroid from his jacket and gave it to the Greenette. Before you got your power, were you shot with an arrow that looked like this? Midoriya's eyes glared at an image of an ancient-looking golden arrow. Even though the artifact didn't look familiar to him, he felt a jolt of anxiety and fear run up his spine at the sight of the artifact. A an arrow? Like, 
The kind you shoot from a boat? Josuke nodded at his anxiously given question. Uh, d no. I, I was on the rooftop of a building after I was saved from a villain attack by All Might. After he left, it sort of just revealed itself, the boy explained. It revealed itself? Josuke contemplated. This villain that attacked you, did he stab you with this arrow, kid? Uh, no. He had a slime quirk that tried to suffocate me to death. It, it didn't have any weapons on him. Hmm. Huh. So you're absolutely positive that you were never shot with this arrow before? We need to know the truth, Midoriya. Please. Well, I... Izuku didn't want to tell Josuke this story as he was showing signs of slight trauma remembering his incident in Morio, but Higashikata's tense glare frightened the boy into spilling the details. Oh, okay. I... I was struck... I, I was struck with an arrow before. When I was younger. About eight years ago, my mom took me on a trip to this town called Morio. The eyebrows of the other stand users curled and raised at that statement. I don't know all the details about what happened, but my mom said someone shot me with a bow and arrow about an hour after we arrived in town. <sighs> Everything went black seconds later and I was taken to the hospital shortly after. Doctors told me that I should have died, but I survived. They even said the area I was shot at healed itself somehow as if I had a regeneration quirk. I don't know anything more than that. Josuke turned to Koichi and the others as they silently thought to themselves about what Izuku had said. Meanwhile, Midoriya turned to Jiro, who gazed at the boy with her eyes open wider than Izuku had ever seen them. Holy shit, Midoriya! Someone shot you? Jiro asked in shock. A and you were, what, seven, eight years old when this happened? Who the fuck shoots a little kid with the bow? Please tell me the cops found whoever did that and they're rotting in jail or dead. Yes, did the dead part. No to the rotting in jail part. Hmm. It's likely one of those things did happen to him. Okuyasu muttered, getting Kyoka's attention. Oi, Josuke! You first met Jotaro about eight years ago, right? Yeah. Which means this kid have to have gone to his stand from either your brother, Yoshikake's father, or that Akira guy. Okuyasu looked down at the table and tightened his hand into a fist at the mention of his brother's murderer's name. Still, though, that's a bit strange. Normally, when someone's struck with the arrow, their stand ability gets awoken within a minute or so after they wake up. But Midoriya received his several years later. Hmm. Well, the reason we ask is because this arrow you're looking at can make people stand users, Midoriya. If you get stabbed with it, it can survive its effects, that is. We were worried someone was running around your city making people stand users, which would cause far more problems than we can handle. <sighs> Thank God that's not the case. Josuke took back the Polaroid he gave Midori and finished off his cappuccino as Izuku contemplated that explanation for a moment. He realized to himself that everything the man was telling him was slowly starting to make sense. He didn't develop a late-blooming quirk with strange properties as he thought, but was instead stabbed by an unusual arrow and was made a stand user as a result. It would take time for the Greenette to process that reality. Okay, that's all the little stuff out of the way. Now, we need to talk about why we're here, Midoriya. Well, the other reason. Have you heard of a man by the name of Joseph Joestar? Midoriya and Jiro thought for a second if they knew his name before the duo answered no to the question. He's a big-time real estate mogul in the United States that runs a very successful real estate company called Joestar Reality. He's also my father. I first met him about eight years ago when we were looking for this stand user murdering in Morio at the time. I'll spare you the details that lead up to it. But in a bizarre set of circumstances, we came across an invisible baby that was lying just shy of one of the roads in town. Yeah, an actual baby on the side of the street on a sunny afternoon. Alone. This baby coincidentally had a stand user called Achtung Baby that could turn its user and anything close to it completely invisible. We tried to find the kid's mother, but finding the parents of an invisible baby with no way to identify it was next to near impossible. Because we had no way to find her mother... My old man adopted the baby into his family and named her Shizuka. After he left town and returned to the States, his wife at the time, Susie Q, was on a several-week-long rampage because of an affair where it was discovered that Joseph cheated on his wife with my mom. Josuke's story was briefly halted as he noticed Midori and Jiro react in light shock and disgust at the last sentence. Uh-oh, forgot to include that part earlier. 
well, long story short, he came within a hair's length of getting divorced over the whole thing, as Susie Q's trust in him was practically shattered. My old man spent years trying to win back her love and be a better person in the process, but, well, about two years ago, Susie Q passed away in her sleep from a stroke. She died before she could truly forgive my old man for what he did. His wife's death really messed him up. I mean, he already had issues with his cognitive and physical health, but the death of his wife of 60-plus years? Yeah, that really got to him. After Susie's death, he decided to devote the rest of his life to becoming the kind of man that would make his wife forgive him. So he made a bucket list of things to do in order to accomplish this. One of the things on that list is why we're here. He wants Shizuka Joestar to reunite with her old family and make peace with them. The one that deserted her years ago. Wait! What? Wait, what? Why the hell would he want that? Jiro assertively interrupted. If I had parents that abandoned me on the side of the street when I was a baby, I would never, ever want to see them again. Hell, I'd smack him stupid if I ever saw him again. Ugh, to be honest, I'm not 100% on the ordeal either, Josuke stated. But if you look at this from my father's point of view, it somewhat makes sense why he'd want to do this. Joseph Joestar is 87 years old and Shizuka is almost 9. Eventually, she's going to wonder who her real family is and why they abandoned her. She already knows Joseph isn't her real dad, and with the way his health is, we don't know how much longer he's going to be around to care for her. I mean, my nephew Jotaro agreed to take care of her if the worst happens, but... Joseph wants to help her get some answers and peace of mind from her previous family and find out why they'd forsaken her in the first place. Majordia nodded his head as he began to understand Joseph's plea. So, the first thing we had to do was find out who her family was. So my father got one of those ancestry DNA tests from the Speedwagon Foundation and sent him a sample of Shizuka's DNA to get tested. It took a month and few weeks, but we got the test back. According to the results, Shizuka comes from a family by the name of Hagakure. The eyes of the two UA students widened in surprise the second they heard the name he said to them. W wait Hagakure? Midoriya thought in his head. Hold on, I know a girl in school whose last name is Hagakure. Wait a second. The DNA test showed that this Hagakure family had a several generation history of possessing invisibility quirks. The test also showed that this family had a 15 year old girl named Toru, who also possesses an invisibility quirk. The Speedwagon Foundation did further investigative work and discovered this Toru girl is currently a student at UA High. That's why we wanted to reach out to you, Midoriya. Since you're a UA High student and possess a stand, we believe you're the best person for helping us with Joseph Joestar's request. Both Izuku and Jiro were silent for about 10 seconds as they couldn't believe what he had said. It took Midori about 10 seconds to get out of his mind-blown state to finally say something. Holy... Sh sugar. I... Uh, okay. So how am I supposed to help you guys with this? What can I do? Well... You're going to have to find this Hagakure girl and tell her about us, Josuke answered. It's not going to be an easy discussion topic, but we think it's best if you were straightforward. I assume that you and your friend here are on your way to, or coming back from, UA. So whenever you're back in school, find her and tell her about us. Once you do that, we can set up a reunion for Shizuka. Here, take this. Josuke wrote something on a napkin and gave it to Midoriya, telling the boy that it was his phone number. He finished up by saying that as soon as he spoke to Hagakure and told her everything, or if he needed anything else, to call him. Um, well, about that. I'm going to be busy with my hero internship for the rest of the week, so it'll be some time before. Just then, Izuku panicked, as he wondered what time it was. He looked at the time on his phone and saw that it was 8 minutes past 11. Oh my god, I'm late for my first internship day! Oh jeez! Izuku quickly grabbed his backpack and hero briefcase as he bowed before Josuke and his friends. Thank you for the time, Mr. Hagashikata, sir. You've really given me some helpful answers about my personal Jesus act, too. I'll definitely talk to you sometime later today about this thing with your father, though. I'll see you later! Midoriya jogged off with Jiro hot on his tail as the UA students went off to their separate hero agencies, as Josuke and the others watched them leave. Well, guess that's taken care of, Koichi remarked. At least there isn't anyone running around making people stand users like we feared. You'll have to call Jotaro and tell him the news. Definitely, Josuke responded. Thank God Midori is one of the good ones. He's a little odd, but he seems like a nice kid. But his stand is definitely on the weaker side, though. I could tell that just by looking at it, and it's definitely weaker than all four of our stands. It's probably just as or less powerful than your Echo's Act 2 once was, Koichi. 
Well, I don't know, Josuke. Did you hear what he called his stand before he left? Koichi asked. Personal Jesus Act 2. Act 2, Josuke. His stand is in its second phase. Which means, yeah, it'll eventually evolve into a third form. Higashikata answered. Hmm. When that happens, who knows how powerful his stand will be. Well, like I said, he's one of the good ones. So we'll keep in touch with him and see what happens. After finishing their brunch, the stand user group left the cafe to sightsee and check out the rest of the city and find any pro heroes they might recognize, while Okuyasu was hoping to run into Mirko or Mount Lady get an autograph of the female heroes. Eventually, Midoriya made it to Kamui Woods' hero agency with one of his sidekicks just outside the door of the building. He mentioned that Kamui was worried Midoriya might have gotten lost and was minutes away from going out to look for him. The sidekick told Midoriya to get dressed in his hero costume as quickly as possible and head on up to the second floor where Kamui Woods was waiting. It took Midoriya three minutes to change and head upstairs, but once he got there, he walked into what looked like an office space with boxes packed full of stuff laying around and three people in the room turning their heads to the green net as he entered. One was the sidekick Midoriya met a moment ago, the other was Kamui Woods himself, which made the boy go starstruck as soon as he gazed at the pro hero. The third person was a girl about Izuku's age in a white toga-style dress with black boots and a head full of vines. Ah, uh, yes. Her. Ah, Deku, there you are. I was worried you got lost with how late you are. You should never be late when you're a hero, Deku. Every second counts in this type of work. A lot can happen if you're not fast enough, the pro hero spoke. Um, yes, I'm very sorry, sir. I was lost with the directions, Izuku explained. But I'm very honored and grateful to do work with you, sir. I'll do my best. Hmm. We'll see. Anyway, Bidoria, this is Ibara Shiyosaki, hero named Maria. She's in the UA hero course like you are. She'll be working alongside you for the duration of the internship. The vine-haired girl turned to Bidoria, smiled, and bowed her head to the boy. It's a pleasure to meet you, Bidoria. I look forward to working alongside you. Chiyosaki greeted, with Midoriya returning a bow to the girl. The first thing that came across Izuku's mind was how pure and innocent she seemed. Now then, I saw you both during the festival, Kamui Woods noted. The two of you did well and have interesting and fantastic quirks with great hero potential. I got one week to teach you two everything I know about being a hero. I just hope you two can keep up. All right, come on. We'll start things off with the patrol. I'll explain more to being a hero while we're out. Sidekick, we'll be back in a few hours. Notify me if anything urgent comes through. The sidekick gestured a thumbs up to the hero as Kamui led the green-haired teens out of the building. The internships had officially begun. <laughs> Several days passed as Izuku was into the fourth day of his hero internship. Since he started, he surprisingly learned a few new techniques with his stand that had never crossed Midoriya's mind before. The tricks he learned were meant to improve his mobility with getting around faster compared to running, as Kamui deduced that Shiozaki and Midoriya's biggest drawback were that they both lacked movement and agility when using their powers. As such, Kamui dedicated his time to teaching the two hero students to use their quirks to move around better, whether in a fight or to rush to a crime scene. In this case, Midoriya and Shiozaki were outside of Kamui Woods' agency as the duo was in the midst of an agility exercise, the exercise being to use their quirks to scale up the side of his hero agency building as quickly as possible. All right, you two are going to do this once more, then we'll take a break, Kamui coached. Maria, remember to bunch up your vines into multiple tendrils for enhanced strength and durability. At Deku, try to speed it up a little with how fast you can move with this technique. All right, you two, get ready. And go! Midoriya summoned his stand as Act 2 knew what it was to do. Midoriya hopped into the air, landing with the squat on his stand shield, which was lifted over Personal Jesus' head, creating a small platform for Midoriya to stand on. Midoriya deduced that since his stand could hover and float, he could use his stand shield as a platform to stand on, while Act 2 could carry the boy and, in a way, make him fly. Meanwhile, Ibarra's vines twisted into each other like braids as her vines traveled up the building to the guardrail on the rooftop. As soon as her vine's grip was tight on the rail, she began climbing up the building using the bricks on the side of the building, like a makeshift rock wall. At the same time, her vines hoisted herself up the building like a winch. Eventually, they reached the top where Kamui Woods was waiting with the stopwatch to get Midoriya's and Shiozaki's times. With Izuku about five seconds slower than his previous time, with Shiozaki being slower by two seconds as she fell onto her hands and knees, panting from the exercise and even rubbed her hand on the back of her neck. Torn. I'm slowing down somehow, 
Hidoria thought to himself. Maybe I should put in a support course request for a grappling hook. Should help with getting up buildings better with this technique and put less strain on my stand. Then again, is it possible for stands to get physically stronger with workouts? I'll have to call Josuke and ask him if that's possible. All right, you two. We'll take a 20-minute break, then continue with more training and finish the day with the patrol. Till then, I got a surprise for you two. The Arbor Hero reached into a paper bag and pulled out water bottles and bento boxes for his students. Kamui Woods brought his students lunch from a nearby restaurant to get their energy and spirits up. The two students smiled at the kindness of their teacher, with Shiozaki looking like she was about to tear up at the sight of the lunchbox. Thank you for this meal, kind sir. I am very grateful for your sincere charity. Kamui smiled and handed the girl her lunch, thinking at the back of his head that Ibura was far too pure for this world. The trio sat on the rooftop of the hero agency as they enjoyed their meal, with Ibara still rubbing the back of her neck, which caught her mentor's attention. You feeling all right there, Shiozaki? You look like you strained yourself with that last exercise. Yes, I think I went a tad too rough with that last climb, Ibara explained. I don't wish to admit it, but I'm quite exhausted, and the technique I'm using is really starting to hurt my neck. But it's the only thing I can come up with for moving myself up this building. Forgive my words of self-doubt, sir, but... Perhaps my quirk is not meant to be one of agility, like yours is. Well, I wouldn't say that, Shiozaki, Hidoria refuted. Your power's incredible. I've seen what you can do with your quirk, and I'm sure if you can keep at it, you'll find something that can work for you. Maybe you can wrap your vines around your arms for support and extend the vines out to latch onto things. Kind of like what my classmate Sarah can do when he swings around with his tape. Shiozaki thought for a few seconds about Midoriya's idea. Hmm. I never thought about that, actually. Thank you for the recommendation, Midoriya. I'll definitely try that after our break, Shizaki stated as Midoriya went to eat some of his rice. You know, speaking of quirks, Midoriya, I'm very curious about yours in particular, mainly with the name you call it, Personal Jesus. Tell me, Midoriya, I've known you for several days now, and forgive me if I sound judgmental, but you don't come off as someone of religious faith. Do you have any religious beliefs, Midoriya? Uh, well, I never thought about it much, to be honest. Midoriya answered, Why do you ask? During the sports festival, me and the others in our class noticed you kept calling your quirk personal Jesus. I'm curious to know why you call it that. I figured it was for religious reasons, like how my attacks are named after biblical terms. But since you claim not to be a boy of faith, then what's the meaning behind the name of your quirk? Yuzuko felt a bit of tension in the girl's voice, as if there were hints that she was secretly interrogating the boy to get an honest answer. But he remembered what to say in case the question was ever brought up. As bad of an excuse as it was, as telling her the truth would complicate things. Uh, well, Personal Jesus is a song by the band Depeche Mode. It's, uh, my favorite song. So I just, you know, named it that. Shizaki raised a confused eyebrow at Midoriya's response, not expecting to hear the boy give that kind of answer. Even Kamui was was dumbfounded and somewhat face-palmed in reaction to his reasoning. Izuku blushed and looked away in awkward embarrassment as he felt he made himself look like a dork to the girl. However, he heard Ibara lightly giggle. <laughs> That's an interesting reason for it, Shizaki replied. Quite different from what I expected. Hmm. Well, Midoriya, I want to tell you something. I understand that to some I come off as stern and at times vindictive when it comes to my religious beliefs, but I am a free spirit when it comes to the beliefs of others, even to those who aren't of spirituality. So if you think I'm offended by you calling your quirk personal Jesus, don't be. You've been blessed with a great power, Midoriya, and I hope you'll be a good hero with it one day. Izuku smiled at Shiozaki's kind words as he grabbed some sushi with his chopsticks. I'll definitely try my best. You know, Shiozaki, I've been wondering about your quirk as well. Can your vines... Izuku's question was interrupted as his phone's ringtone went off. Midoriya reached into his pocket, pulled out his phone, and saw who was calling him. Uraraka? Huh, wonder what she wants. I'm oh, sorry, Shizaki, do you mind if I take this? The vine girl gave him the go-ahead as he answered the call. Um, hey, Uraraka, what's up? As Izuku was listening to his friend, Kamui changed the discussion to ask Ibara how she's liking Yue Hi. Shizaki passionately brought up the many friends she's made in Class B and how kind they were to her mainly her closest friends, Yotetsu Awase and Pony Tsunotori, even breaking up how Tsunotori introduced her to some anime shows that she became a fan of, with one of her surprise favorites being a coming-of-age drama involving an anthropomorphic wolf and a white dwarf rabbit. 
However, before she could explain the show any further... Wait, Uraraka, slow down a second! What? what happened?! Shizaki and Kamui turned to Izuku as his look changed to one of seriousness and extreme worry. Huh? Ida? What are you talking about? Midoriya, is everything alright? Was questioned. About 13 seconds of tense silence filled the space as Midoriya began tearing up and shaking as he covered his mouth, causing Woods and Shizaki to look at the boy with great concern. He didn't want to believe what Uraraka just told him. Oh my god. Ida. No. Midoriya, what, what's wrong? Izuku lowered the phone from his ear as he could feel himself seconds away from breaking out into tears. It, it's my classmate. Ida. He... He was killed last night. A villain killed Ida. <gasps> Oh my word, Midoriya, I- Oh dear. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. What a cliffhanger. What a cliffhanger to end on. I'm so sorry for leaving you guys on this cliffhanger. But before you leave, we'd just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes, including the Abridged channel, in which I voice Mina. I also help produce content and share some memes for the meme channel. All the information you'll need to know is right here in the description. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day! Arrivederci.